Howdy everyone, this is Ursat's Cats, or just Walter if you prefer. Last month, Carl Jobs did a tremendous video about various recent developments in the ongoing saga of video game cheater Billy Mitchell. Among these developments was a claim that Billy had lied about a video game score specifically at the Music City Multicon in Lebanon, Tennessee on October 31st of last year. In short, at the event, Billy claimed he had just gotten a perfect score on Pac-Man in front of a live audience, when in fact, he had achieved no such thing. Now, despite the evidence Carl provided in his video, I've seen a few special individuals on social media claim that this is not what happened at all, that they were there, and that Billy was clear with everyone that this was not a perfect score. I know, it's pretty shocking that someone would lie on the internet like that. But really, I'd like to thank these people, because without them, I probably would have just left the matter alone. Sure, Billy lied. Also, water is wet and dogs bark a lot. But since someone out there might see those competing accounts from people claiming to have witnessed the situation firsthand, and since the evidence might otherwise become forgotten or lost to time, I decided it's important to put everything in one place where everyone can see it. And rather than my usual platform of 10,000 word screeds, I thought it might be fun to try my hand at an actual narrated video this time. So join me as we take another look at what I call the Music City Con. If you want to skip ahead to just the stuff about Music City, I'll put a timestamp link in the description. Otherwise, stick around and we'll discuss the series of events leading up to it. Before I continue, I do wish to make a technical note that some of the materials I'll be referencing belong to Billy. And while fair use for commentary is a thing, ostensibly even on YouTube, Billy Mitchell is a petty man, and he has filed copyright strikes for the use of such material before, so I'm choosing to just avoid that altogether. If he really wants to be known as the guy who doesn't want anyone to see the evidence, I will let him wear that mantle. None of his footage is essential to what I'll be talking about today. Also, since I will be talking about Billy Mitchell and about Pac-Man, I should tell you about two written works of mine. One of them is The Evidence Against Billy Mitchell. Have any questions about those cheated Donkey Kong scores? Want to know what a girder finger is? Want to hear about that fake board swap again? Or that old MTV interview? You don't need to borrow Dwayne Richards' time machine. You'll find it all at our website, perfectpacman.com. Which, funny enough, used to be Billy's website. But that's a long story, I wouldn't want to bore you with the details. The other written work I'd recommend is a bit longer, but I think it's well worth the read. It's a nine-part series called The Video Game Fraud of the Century. That presentation was the result of a ton of research into Billy's claimed perfect score of Pac-Man in 1999, his Player of the Century Award, which he got from Walter Day, and his trip to the Tokyo Game Show. Spoiler, Billy Mitchell lies a lot. That dude lies like McDonald's does fries. That's also available at perfectpacman.com as are links to the sources for this video. Check it out. We don't even have ads. This isn't even a commercial plug. I just think if you like this video, you will find that project very interesting. Hey, Future Ursets here. After recording most of the audio for this, I wrote an update to the Billy Mitchell Twin Galaxies legal battle. Billy's original lawyer bailed on his law firm and his replacements recently took a big fat L. In fact, they're probably wondering if they're actually going to get paid for any of this. You can find that update at perfectpacman.com as well. Okay, back to the show. So first things first, we're going to have to explain what we mean when we say a perfect score of original Pac-Man. Basically, it means eating every little dot, every power pellet, every blue ghost, and every fruit for 255 levels, then getting the limited points available on the game's kill screen, also known as the split screen, which we'll get to in a moment. Now you might say, geez, that sounds insane! You've got to get all four blue ghosts off each power pellet? And there are four power pellets on each board? And there are 255 boards? That's like 4,000 ghosts! Well, no, not quite that many. On original Pac-Man, the ghosts only turn blue for 17 boards. And on some of those boards, the blue time as they call it, lasts a little while. So you can take those somewhat casually. The most difficult boards are the one second boards as they call them, where the ghost's blue time only lasts a single second. There are six of those one second boards, for those, you have to either use a prearranged pattern or one of various clumping techniques where you can manipulate the ghosts into a single pile and lead them to the power pellet to get them all at once. These usually make use of the fact that the ghosts slow down in the side tunnel while Pac-Man does not. And there are other cool tricks you can do to help you perfect your score, or just for extra swag. You can run patterns where Pac-Man goes right through the ghosts due to poor collision detection. There are turns that the ghosts can't make, allowing you an easy escape when you need it. 
You can even park Pac-Man in certain hiding spots, in some cases indefinitely, just in case maybe you're feeling sleepy and you want to pick up your game the next morning. At any rate, once you're at board 21, which people call the ninth key, the ghost speed stays the same for the rest of the game. So from there on, you can use the same prearranged pattern on each board to collect all the dots and keys, just running this one pattern over and over for three hours or so, all the way to the split screen. For those who don't know, on board 256, the byte which tracks game levels rolls over, going from 255 to 0, and thus the game tries to draw board 0. The game would actually succeed in doing so, if not for the little algorithm that draws your fruits in the corner. Instead of drawing 7 of them, it tries to draw 256 of them, which end up appearing as computer garbage, overriding about 52% of the board on the right side. You cannot pass this board, because you can't eat enough dots to register a board completion. You can only eat enough to make one key appear, and almost enough to make the second one appear too. On original Pac-Man, this is the end of your game. As a quick note, there seems to be a phenomenon of casual players seeing this screen and thinking that it is the perfect score, that you've broken the game, you made all the crazy stuff appear, and therefore you did the cool special thing. And the screen does look really weird. But this is just what happens when you reach board 256, whether you minimized or maximized your points or whatever. On the original game, it always happens here, no matter what. Will the fact that casual observers mistake the split screen for a perfect score be relevant later? Hmm, there's a chance. As far as doing an actual perfect score, the split screen is a little complicated in that there are actually 9 dots among the computer garbage which regenerate for each of your lives. What this means is, under today's definition of a perfect score, you have to carry all your spare lives to the final screen so you can effectively cash them in for maximum points. Actually, playing the split screen is fairly simple though. Just park your Pac-Man in the bottom right corner, facing down, near the letters BC, which of course stand for Billy Cheated. Then watch as three of the ghosts trap themselves in an inescapable tunnel. You don't even have to do anything more, just sit there and they neutralize themselves. This gives you almost complete freedom to collect all those hidden dots. You do have to watch out for Clyde still, but he's not much of a threat anywhere except the bottom left corner, which happens to be his home. And even then, if you have six lives, you'll have six chances to get those regular dots near him. As a quick bit of history, the first documented perfect score in Pac-Man occurred on September 6th, 1982 by Bill Bastable of New Jersey. The score is acknowledged with a personalized letter from Bally Midway, the American manufacturers of the game. Although to be fair, game companies mostly couldn't tell you what the top scores in their games actually are, typically relying on the players themselves for that sort of expertise. But Bastable's score was real, and he repeated the feat a few times in the following months. This was before players discovered all the hidden dots on the split screen, and in an era when the rules weren't really clear about what was in or out of bounds. Over time, Twin Galaxies founder Walter Day was happy to craft those rules to the benefit of whichever player he happened to favor at any given time, giving Billy an opportunity to be the, air quotes, first, to do a perfect score 17 years later. For a claimed score which, it turns out, he may not have even actually finished. We'll get back to that a bit later, wink wink. I know this is a lot to throw at you, but the important takeaway in all of this is that there are actually different perfect scores on Pac-Man depending on which platform you're playing, which settings you have for the game, and at least historically, whether you're going for the later discovered hidden dots. Usually today when someone refers to a perfect score of Pac-Man, they're talking about the original arcade game with the maximum 6 lives for a final score of 3,333,360. But you can play on the factory default settings, which only grant 4 lives for a perfect score of 3,333,180. If you wanted, you could even use the game's dip switches to set the game to only one life with no bonus, which would allow for a perfect score of 3,332,910. Or maybe you don't have access to the switches and you can only play at whatever number of lives the machine happens to be set to. That's fine. There are also variations of the original game, which can have their own maximum scores. And, it just so happens, we'll be talking about two of those variations later. But as far as perfect score variants go, the only requirement is that the game has to have a final screen, like the original does. Otherwise you could just keep playing and accumulating points forever. Okay, with all of that out of the way, let's talk Billy Mitchell. I'm going to assume you know about Billy's overall backstory, the King of Kong, and all that. So I'm going to skip ahead to the summer of 2018. Billy's scores had just been removed from Twin Galaxies and from Guinness World Records after it was proven his Donkey Kong score tapes could not have been produced on an original unmodified arcade machine, as Billy had always claimed. In response, Billy appeared at that year's Southern Fried Gaming Expo to announce the beginning of his Road to Redemption Tour. 
Obviously, this road to redemption didn't involve, you know, actually apologizing for cheating and for lying to people for all those years. Instead, Billy told a bunch more lies, waved around a stack of secret papers, called Jace Hall silly names, and smacked his lips a lot. It's ironic to think, though, if Billy had just confessed there in 2018, most people would have forgiven him by now. He wouldn't have had to put together all these legal threats and wouldn't have had to pile on a bunch more lies to make up for the old ones. He wouldn't be $100,000 deep in losing lawsuits on two different continents, and he wouldn't be getting sued for $6 million? Dude, what are you doing? What are you doing? You know, as well as I do, that your sworn testimony is full of lies. Don't you have a family? And a business? Next Halloween, I'm going to go as Billy Mitchell. I'm not going to wear a suit or a tie or a wig or any of that stuff. My entire costume will just be me making a series of exceedingly poor life choices. So, getting back to this Road to Redemption, the SFGE panel was where Billy announced his intention to redo the contested Donkey Kong scores, as if doing so would make everyone forget about the evidence or something. The Music City Con is actually just the latest in this series of attempts by Billy to interact positively with the public, and to show that perhaps he does actually have some talent in some of these games he cheated at. Let's take a look at how well this campaign has gone for him so far. First up, after some practice, Billy did two Donkey Kong scores of exactly 1 million points. That's nice, except of course that it doesn't prove anything. Playing Donkey Kong in 2018 does nothing to answer the question of whether Billy cheated at Donkey Kong in 2010. But to make matters worse, Billy went around lying and saying he did three such scores in a week instead of two. His stream on August 3rd of that year even concluded with him saying, quote, Sorry we didn't do our third million, end quote. And then he just didn't get back to it. Again, I would show you the clip, but Billy Mitchell hates evidence. Truly, I'm not sure why Billy would even lie about that. Two scores of a million on Donkey Kong? That's already a solid outing, at least for a non-1.1 million player like himself. Is it some weird game where he thinks if he lies and says it was three, it'll compel people like me to go around reporting that he hit a million twice? Because dude, I'm not afraid of the truth, and if Billy Mitchell wants me to call him a lying sack of shit, I am more than willing to do so. My guess is, he had his heart set on getting three, and he just can't admit even to himself that he failed at something he wanted. He may have even convinced himself on some level that his fantasy really did happen. But really, who even knows with this guy? Billy continued streaming Donkey Kong on Twitch that year. A couple weeks later, on August 16th, he did a score of 1,047,500, and on November 23rd, he did a score of 1,050,100. But of course, he couldn't help but lie about that too. Specifically, he has said many times in many interviews that he showed up his detractors by hitting the exact scores that were contested in the score dispute. The problem, of course, is that objective reality disagrees with him yet again. He overshot the lowest score by 300 points due to a straight fireball. Then he fell 100 short of the middle score due to an untimely death. In reality, he just sort of got within the range of those old scores on his last life, way behind the score pace from his cheated tapes. And he relies on people not understanding any of that and looking only at his final score, which, oh yeah, he had to lie about anyway. In one interview, he even gave this elaborate description of a conversation he claims to have had with someone during his game in August, except... He uploaded that stream to YouTube, and you can just watch it, and you can see that none of this bullshit ever happens? <sighs> oh, Billy. He continued streaming Donkey Kong for months until July 2019 when he set his sights on Pac-Man. Streaming live from Fun Spot in New Hampshire, he sought to do a new perfect score on July 3rd, which was the 20th anniversary of the day he claims to have gotten his first perfect score back in 1989. July 3rd went by, no perfect score. July 4th went by, no perfect score. But hey, he got it on July 5th, which honestly is close enough. It's not like there are better players who can hit perfect scores on demand at any time. A month later, Billy traveled to Australia to play not in the Kong Off, which is the standard Donkey Kong tournament series, but in the Australian Kong Off, despite, you know, not being Australian. None of the top 25 players in the world were there, which was fortunate for Billy. No McCurdy, no Lakeman, no Copeland, no Saglio. 
there were some ahem, reports that Billy didn't play by the rules. Some might even go as far as to say he cheated. But the organizers who paid for his flight out there didn't disqualify him. And in the end, he won the top spot, which is where he got that belt he loves to show off. I'm sure that after spending his life evading top competitions and making up stories about hitting world records in front of his mortgage broker friends, it must feel pretty good to actually have an actual trophy from an actual competition. Billy kept on the Donkey Kong grind on Twitch, even through filing his legal threats and lawsuits in early 2020. It was during this time that he floated the idea that he would attempt a world record on Ms. Pac-Man. Without getting too deep into it, the Ms. Pac-Man game was given a few modifications to thwart the continuous motion patterns that defeated the original Pac-Man. What this means is one has to play using freehand grouping techniques if they want to maximize points from ghosts. But more importantly, there are major RNG elements not present in original Pac-Man. After a certain level, the fruits are random, with the 5,000 point bananas being the most favorable. Also, when you reach Ms. Pac-Man's kill screen, the game can randomly give you as many as 8 extra boards. Thus, the world record really can come down to who gets the best RNG on a given run. What I'm getting at is, this declaration is actually majorly sus, coming from someone who has not only lied and cheated, but has gone so far as to produce entire fake tapes to substantiate bogus high score claims. Nothing has come of this declaration yet, but who knows, maybe Billy's toadies just haven't found the version of MAME that looks like Arcade yet. Moving ahead a few months, on May 26, 2020, Steve Weeby, the original King of Kong, showed up on the Twin Galaxies website announcing his intention to take another shot at a new high score. Four weeks later, Weeby had reached a new personal benchmark with a score of 1,106,200, which was his first time breaking the 1.1 million mark. Weeby was the 21st player to reach that milestone. Billy must have felt a little... jealous because on his stream three days later he tried really hard, and he notched a new personal best as well. Now, you might have noticed earlier that Billy had three contested Donkey Kong scores, right? And that he kind of got close to the bottom one, then kind of got close to the middle one, and then just didn't bother trying to match the third one? Well, he didn't bother trying to match it here either. When he finally got the opportunity, he just zoomed right past it, eventually landing at 1,092,100. Yes, that's right. In less than a month, Steve Weeby nailed a 1.1 million score, which Mr. Mullet couldn't do in two years of streaming and still has not done in any sort of public venue. As I said before, the score pace on each of these Twitch scores is still well behind Billy's two highest cheated tapes. The easiest way to compare them is to see what score Billy was at when he reached level 21. As you can see, his cheated scores were quite an exaggeration of what he has actually shown himself to be capable of. But again, there's no need for him to actually match his bogus tapes when he can just lie and say that he did, and some people will still choose to take him at his word. So we've looked at a few examples now of Billy misrepresenting scores to the public, either by lying about the actual scores themselves, or at least misrepresenting their significance. But we have one more stunt to cover before we get to the Music City Con, and that is Billy's so-called Beyond Perfect Score on Pac-Man in November of 2020. Better get comfortable, folks, because you're going to be here a while. Every year, Guinness announces a Guinness World Records Day. It's kind of like one of those oddball holidays you see in trivia books, like Stupid Haircut Day or Pass Emulation Off as Arcade Day. I'm sure that's in there somewhere. Obviously, this is a promotional vehicle for Guinness, but since Guinness and Billy were back in good graces by this point, Billy used the opportunity to attempt something which, so he claimed, no one had ever done before. Billy streamed several hours that day from Galloping Ghosts Arcade near Chicago, who rolled out the red carpet for their special guest. Billy was cryptic about what exactly he was trying to achieve, simply playing Pac-Man on the 20-year reunion cabinet released in 2000. This machine lets you choose between Ms. Pac-Man and Galaga. However, if you execute a variation of the famous Contra code, you can also play original Pac-Man as sort of a bonus feature. It didn't take long for the community to figure out what he was up to. For whatever reason, the split screen on this version of Pac-Man has a tenth hidden dot. It's doubtful this was intended. The original Pac-Man overwrote the board with random code, and since this version has slightly different random code, the results are a little different. At any rate, this extra dot allows a player to boost their score an additional 60 points. Not only that, those six extra dots cause the second key to appear, resulting in a higher perfect score of 3,338,420 when playing with six lives. This is all fine as long as you're clear that you're playing on a variant, but what made this stream peculiar were the between-game cutaways. Billy restarted his game eight times that day, and these were no short games. 
and almost every time Billy restarted, the feed would cut away to avoid showing the reunion machine menu. In some cases, Billy would just physically stand in front of the camera, blocking the view, while someone else reinitialized Pac-Man for him. This led people to wonder if maybe Billy was hoping to trick the general gaming audience into believing he had found a way to exceed the known perfect score on the original game, rather than simply being upfront about the fact that he was playing on a known variant. Unfortunately for Billy, he's not as good at Pac-Man as he thinks he is. One day of failed attempts became two, which became three, and these weren't short days either. The first day he streamed for over 11 hours. The third day, over 10 hours. I'm reluctant to say just how many new game attempts this involved because I feel like I probably missed a few. Things got worse for Billy's little publicity tour when a new challenger entered the battlefield. On Billy's third day of attempts, the true reigning Pac-Man champion, David Race, fired up his stream opposite Billy's. It just so happens that David and Billy have a little history together. You see, David kept trying to prove Billy's innocence, much longer than most people. Eventually he realized, wow, this dude really has been lying to me the entire time. David then turned over his materials to Twin Galaxies for their legal defense, so Billy started spewing a bunch of slander about David. The best part was... Actually, hold up. We're going to detour for a bit, because this is too good to gloss over. In April 2018, during the Twin Galaxies score dispute, Billy called David Race on the phone to tell him about his master plan. He was going to record a new game of Donkey Kong, then try to make it look like it was one of his missing tapes. Then he would expose all the haters when it was revealed to be a new score done on Arcade and not an old score on MAME. This plan was so hilariously dumb for so many reasons. People in the dispute would have immediately sussed out that it was Arcade and not MAME, since they were using actual science and not witness statements from their friends. They also would have compared this game to the limited footage we have from the missing tape and seen, no, this isn't the same game at all. Also, why would Billy want to be known as the guy who plants fake evidence to cover up for his old fake evidence? Even David Race himself on the call, and this was at a time when David was still firmly in Billy's camp, even he was like, dude, are you sure about this? Have you actually thought this through for like two seconds? You can listen to this for yourself, linked in the sources. This was all revealed in court filings, which were published in October 2020, merely one month prior to Billy's big stunt at Galloping Ghosts. Which brings us back to day three of Billy grinding away for hours and hours at that poor reunion machine, when David Race fired up his own stream. David made one attempt, and he nailed a perfect score on original Pac-Man, live, on his first try. Sure, this was on the original Pac-Man cabinet in David's home, and not on a reunion machine, but it's the same game for 255 boards. The only difference is the number of free dots you collect on the split screen, which are effectively irrelevant in terms of difficulty, and which in this case, are moot anyway, since Billy had yet to get anywhere near the split screen in his attempts. The Twin Galaxies website commemorated David's perfect score with a feature article. Remember, this was while Billy's failed attempts were still streaming on. Someone at TG was clearly having some fun. Check this out. <clears throat> It is important to understand that an average player attempting to achieve such an accomplishment would simply be reaching beyond their ability, embarrassingly struggling for hours and hours, day after day, resetting the game to try over and over again with nothing but frustration and failure. Day 4 and Billy was still at it. You could see him on stream like a true video gaming champion, blaming his controller. And you can't say, oh well maybe this version of Pac-Man is just slightly different from the original Pac-Man he's used to, and maybe that was tripping him up. Because, if you go back, you can actually see a reunion machine inside Billy's home alongside his Donkey Kong cabinet in streams at least as far back as October 2019. No excuses dude, you had over a year to figure this out. Day 5. Still no end in sight. The children keep asking about you, Billy. They want to know when you're coming home. I told them you had to chase away some evil ghosts. That's true enough, I suppose. During that evening's stream, Billy whiffed on a key worth 5,000 points, but just didn't notice. He kept on playing for six more boards while the chat was trying to urge anyone on site to inform Billy that his game was over. We're now up to day 6 when Billy's stream got bumped from Galloping Ghost's Twitch channel to their Facebook page to accommodate some regularly scheduled Monday content. I'm guessing they didn't expect all of this to last this long. 
Oh, and for whatever it's worth, that arcade was totally supposed to close back on Billy's Day 3 for new COVID-19 protocols. On Day 6, there was a great clip. I wish I could show it to you. But in their multi-camera display, you can see both the game board and Billy's hand on the control. You see him running the same ninth key pattern he always does. Up left, up right, up left. He's buffering a lot of these turns very early. So early, in fact, that when he gets up to the ghost pen, he attempts to buffer his turn above the pen and goes under the pen instead. How do you miss that badly? That's like missing a barn! And of course, he got right up and complained that the controls weren't working right. Another day goes down, and still no perfect score. By day seven, watching this toilet fire wasn't even funny anymore. It was hilarious at first, but now it was just sad. Why would anybody watch this? At this point, even I, yes, Ursat's cats, jealous hater extraordinaire, even I sincerely wanted him to get this stupid score, just so that I wouldn't have to keep paying attention to this fiasco. If hell exists, it's being forced to watch Billy Mitchell fail at Pac-Man over and over and over. are from a jukebox that plays nothing but achy, breaky heart. We're now up to day eight! Remember this? The epic roasting from Twin Galaxies? That was day three! We're up to day eight now! Galloping Ghosts started having some internet connectivity issues. So they switched back over to Facebook recording via the host's cell phone, which resulted in some mirrored footage. As Billy continued playing on the long stretch of ninth keyboards, the host excitedly described the scene and then panned over to film Billy's gameplay just in time for this. Around this time, there were a lot of murmurs on social media wondering what was going to happen next. For those who don't know, in the United States we have a major holiday in late November called Thanksgiving. And in 2020, this holiday fell on November 26th, which would be Billy's ninth day of attempts. And people were wondering, is he going to give up? Is he going to fly back home for a day and then return? What's going to happen? We didn't have a clear answer until that ninth day came and that Galloping Ghost stream fired up as usual for another 10 hours stream. Yes, the Galloping Ghost staff came in to accommodate this guy on Thanksgiving and surprise surprise after 10 more hours he still couldn't complete a perfect score finally on day 10 Black Friday as they call it he got the stupid score mercifully it was over Billy immediately took to Twitter to declare victory without really being clear that this wasn't the original Pac-Man or that difficulty wise there isn't any meaningful difference between collecting 10 hidden dots on the split screen as opposed to 9. Disappointingly there were a few gaming commentators who repeated the party line as it were, expressing astonishment that Billy had beaten the impossible record. These casual observers seemed to be under the impression that Billy had found a way to squeeze a few extra points out of the original game without asking or addressing fundamental questions like, how were these new points not found until 40 years later? And if this is a new perfect score, then why did you go around telling everyone the lower score was a perfect score? I'm not going to put these individuals on blast here, but you can check out the video notes if you want to see examples. Of course, the fact that Billy struggled for 10 days at a game which he claims to be a master of took a bit of shine out of Billy's celebration, as some people were more than happy to point out. This must have needled Billy a bit, because the next day he tweeted out this keep grinding affirmation, attempting to spin this whole 10 day fiasco as some sort of virtue. To go on a short tangent, this message sounds really good in isolation. Yeah, keep on that grind, chase your dreams, don't stop believing. Until you realize that this is just Billy's way of trying to gloss over the fact that it took him 10 days to do what an actual Pac-Man master could smash out in a day. I actually used to be a fan of Billy's, before the cheating evidence. I really liked his motivational talk, but I hadn't picked up on the fact that, coming from him at least, it was all self-service. I made 94 attempts before I got the world record. No, Billy, you cheated, and you want to make it sound like you earned it. 
I spent 10 days because I'm an achiever. No, Billy, you spent 10 days because you suck. And to be clear, too much cynicism is unhealthy, and all of you should work hard toward your goals and chase your dreams. But actually do it, for reals, and not for pretends. Don't be a total fraud like this guy. So to recap, starting in 2018, we've seen Billy lie about Donkey Kong, then lie about Donkey Kong again, then struggle at Pac-Man, then cheat at Donkey Kong, then threaten us with Ms. Pac-Man, then get his butt kicked at Donkey Kong, then go back to Pac-Man again for an epic face plant, while carrying on as if all of this was his plan all along. But what we hadn't yet seen, what we needed to fill our whole bingo card, was for Billy to lie about Pac-Man. Well, a recent Pac-Man game, I mean. Billy has told many, many lies about his Pac-Man scores of the past, which you can read all about in our nine-part series, The Video Game Fraud of the Century, available for free at perfectpacman.com. But whereas Billy had been lying to us about his Donkey Kong scores on Twitch, Billy had yet to tell straight-up, bald-faced lies about a recent Pac-Man score, which brings us to the town of Lebanon, Tennessee, in the greater Nashville area, the site of the Music City Multicon, or as Billy calls it, Multi-City Comic Con. Billy was part of the official itinerary for the October 2021 event, as seen here listed under Room 1. Not everyone was excited to see him, but a few people were. Billy had a booth where he took photos with people, and, present for the festivities, were a Donkey Kong cabinet and a Pac-Man cabinet. The event was three days, but we're mostly interested in Billy's perfect score attempt on Sunday. But before we talk about that, we need to talk about parallel universes. Just kidding. But we do need to talk about yet another revision of Pac-Man. Back in the day, someone figured out that if you solder two specific connections on your Pac-Man circuit board, the game plays just a little differently. The first board plays like the second board, the second board plays like the third board, the third board plays like the fifth board, etc. The fruits you receive still go in order, so it's still a cherry on the first board, then a strawberry, then a peach, etc. They just play the way later boards play on an unmodified game. This came to be known as the Jumper Revision, and was a popular way to boost the game's difficulty and spice it up a little back in the old arcade days. Gotta get all those quarters somehow, you know. In interviews, Billy refers to this version as the Advanced Chip, which isn't really accurate. It's not a different chip, it's the same board, just two of the connections are soldered differently. This is the same guy who still thinks the split screen happens because the game only has enough memory to draw the left half of the board and not the right half. So obviously technical explanations are not his forte. As an aside, I do kind of wonder why Billy keeps saying that though. People figured out what causes the split screen long ago. My guess, and this is just a guess, is that Billy feels the need to stick with his inaccurate version or else he'd have to admit he was wrong, even though literally nobody would care that he was wrong about this. Literally no one. But as long as he sticks to his story, then it's his word versus all those technicians and programmers and magazines and experts and... yeah. Anyway, getting back to the jumper revision, Billy calls it the advanced chip, which as I said is inaccurate, but also it's misleading. I know, put on your shocked faces. Let's hear Billy in his own words at the event. So it's a what's so special, what's different about this particular version of Pac-Man that makes this the first time in the world this is happening. There's been a lot of split screen done on the original Pac-Man. Um, all the perfect scores, for example, that I've done have been on the original. But this one is an advanced chip. It gets harder or faster. It maintains a harder level of difficulty. So it's just never been done. No one ever wanted to attempt to do it. <laughs> this is from a video that was posted to the Music City Multicon Facebook page. This video was later deleted, for what I'm sure are wholesome reasons. It's hard to make out some of what Billy's saying at first. It kind of sounds like he's saying all previous perfect scores were only attempted on the original version of Pac-Man, but obviously he couldn't possibly be saying that, given all the emphasis he gave to his quote beyond perfect score a year before. So let's just pretend we didn't hear that part. The important part is much clearer. I'll repeat it here. Quote, This one is an advanced chip. It gets harder faster. It maintains a harder level of difficulty, so it's just never been done. No one ever wanted to attempt to do it. Why would you make things harder on yourself? End quote. Let's bring that chart back up again. 
What's misleading about this characterization is that, while the jumper version, or the advanced chip as Billy calls it, is harder for novice players who get thrown in deeper water earlier, it's actually easier for advanced players. Look at that! Normally you've got to get to board 21 before you're home free just running the easy pattern to the split screen. But in the jumper version, you're skipping five boards! So you get to the final pattern at board 16. Not only that, three of those boards you skip are blue time boards, which are when the ghosts turn blue. Those boards, where you have to eat each ghost off each power pellet every time, are the real challenge of a perfect score, and you just skip them. This isn't an exact comparison for a few reasons, but imagine a version of Super Mario Bros. where you just skipped the first 12 levels and started on 4-1. Billy would be trying to say, well, this is the harder version because you start on a harder level. But that doesn't make it harder to beat the game, you just skipped a bunch of levels. That actually makes it easier. Anyway, we have one more Billy lie to address before we can move on. Billy said that no one ever wanted to attempt a perfect score on the jumper version, rhetorically asking, why would you make things harder on yourself? Well, different players had indeed attempted perfect scores on the jumper version, going back to the 80s. Bill Bastable acquired a Pac-Man game because he wanted to do a perfect score with the hidden dots, but the game he acquired had the jumper soldered. So what did he do? He smashed out a perfect score on the jumper version before scraping off the solder so he could do his perfect score on the regular version. I should note that these two scores are now considered unofficial since Bastable used the game's internal pause switch to freeze his game in progress, which didn't violate any rules at the time but which today would be considered disqualifying, but he certainly couldn't say that he didn't attempt a jumper perfect score. More recently, in 2016, current Pac-Man champion David Race, yes him again, David Race attempted a perfect score on the jumper version, coming 90 points short on 3 plus 1 settings. It seems that any time Billy does anything, he likes to proclaim he was the first. Okay, now that we understand what was special about this perfect score attempt at Music City Multicon, there are two basic questions we need to answer. Did Billy get a perfect score at the Music City Multicon? And if not, did he misrepresent a failed attempt as a successful one? Let's start with the first question. Did Billy get a perfect score on Pac-Man that day? What's interesting about a perfect score on Pac-Man is, as long as you're on perfect pace, every board will end on a certain score. In other words, you can't carry over point scoring opportunities from one board to another. Here are all the scores you should have after all 256 boards on perfect pace on the original version of Pac-Man. Future Ersatz here again. It turns out that this is a lot of data to stuff onto one screen. It is legible on my desktop monitor, but it might not be legible on the tiny phone screen you're watching on. That's okay, you're not going to miss anything, the narration will still work. If you want to see these charts at full resolution, they can be found in the video notes. Okay, back to the story. Here are all the scores you should have after all 256 boards on perfect pace on the original version of Pac-Man. But we're talking about the jumper modification, which produces different score totals, which you can see here. Now we're going to look at a few still shots from a newscast from WTVF News Channel 5 in Nashville. Based on Billy's score, we can determine these are from board 171 through board 192. I'm going to highlight that range of scores now. They're broadcast out of order, as news reports do, but the game's score lets us keep everything sorted out. To show you an example of what I mean, at 158 in the newscast, we see Billy end a board with a displayed score of 428,800. Note that I say displayed score here. Pac-Man does not display a millions digit, so that's the only unknown we have to figure out. Now, let's go back to that chart of jumper scores. Hmm, gosh, I don't see any score ending in 428800, do you? The closest I see is board 187, where you should end the board with 2,433,800. But if that were the board Billy was playing, he would be 5,000 points short, would he not? Let's try another one. At one minute in that same newscast, you see Billy with a score of 227,090, with 11 dots left on the board. I'll get to why we know those are the only remaining dots in a moment. This means he would end that board with a displayed score of 227200. Let's go back to the chart again. Can you see a score ending in 227200? I can't. Remember, he can't be ahead of a given perfect score, he can only be behind. I do see this one, board 171 which should be 2,232,200. But again, that would mean Billy is exactly 5,000 points short. Let's take a look at a few boards in progress. But to do that, we need to look at the ninth key pattern Billy uses. Ah, here it is. 
This is a modified version of a pattern called Stacked, the origin of which traces back at least to a 1982 book by early Pac-Man pioneers Jim Sikora and John Berkner. Billy uses this ninth key pattern throughout his streamed Pac-Man attempts, so as long as he doesn't go off pattern, we can identify exactly what board he's on when he's on perfect pace. And when he's not on perfect pace, we can at least make an educated guess. Let's go back to the newscast, this time around timestamp 150. Pac-Man has just eaten that dot at the junction, bringing the displayed score up to 221,600. Using that pattern, Billy collects 8 dots, worth 80 points, until he reaches the key, worth 5,000 points. From there, Billy collects 42 more dots, for 420 points, and 2 power pellets, for 100 points, pushing his displayed score up to 227,200. Hey, look at that! That's the score we had on the previous clip, which we determined was on board 171, except Billy, once again, is 5,000 points short. For what it's worth, that clip also lines up with the video seen behind the reporter in the opening of the segment, showing that it was also from Billy's game at the Multicon and was not simply stock footage. Let's do another, this time at the start of a board, as seen at 132 in the newscast. This one's easy. Pac-Man has just eaten the dot at that junction behind the on-screen graphic. He's literally just eaten seven dots to start the board, meaning he began that board with a displayed score of 479200. Let's go back to the chart. Hmm, once again, I don't see any perfect scoreboards ending with 479200. The closest is board 191, which ends at 2,484,200. Again, 5,000 points short. Since we're starting to get into overkill territory, I'll speed these up a bit, but I do want to make sure to catalog all of these, just so there's no confusion in the future. At 226, we see Pac-Man approaching the first key with a displayed score of 253120. Going by his usual pattern, Billy has eaten 72 dots on that board, meaning he started this board with a displayed score of 252400, making this board 174, but 5,000 points short. At 159, we see those same 72 dots eaten, plus another 8 dots, plus a key worth 5,000 points. That means Billy started this board with a displayed score of 378400. That makes this board 184, 5,000 points short. We can do this all day. Here's a photo from Twitter. Looks like poor Billy broke his pattern and had to play freehand for a while. Either that or this was a deliberate attempt to park the game. Anyway, the photo was high enough resolution we can actually zoom in and see the displayed score. You can also see the whole board. You can see all the dots that have been collected, totaling 109 for 1,090 points. And the key has come out by then, so that should be another 5,000 points. Meaning Billy started that board at displayed score 328000, which makes this board 180, but 5,000 points short. You want to see how good we are at this? At 119 in the news clip, we see a close-up of the score. Literally just the score. You see almost none of the game board itself. Now, watch what happens. With a perfect score. It was awesome because it was kind of like... As you see, it counts up by tens before pausing on 429,300. Since we know Billy's playing the jumper version, and since we know what pattern he's using, and since we know he's down by 5,000, we can actually identify that as this stretch on board 188. Billy collects those dots, bringing the score up to 429,300. Then Billy enters the empty area around the ghost pen and the points stop accumulating. If Billy was on perfect pace, between 2 and 3 million, he would have bypassed that score altogether when he ate the second key on board 187. Okay, point is, Billy definitely, definitely, for sure for reals, missed 5,000 points, with the most likely explanation being that he missed a key somewhere. But there's something else going on in these shots. Let's take a look at what a standard ninth keyboard should look like. Take a look at the display along the bottom. Five lives in spare, seven keys along the fruit display. The keys take up a bit more than half the row, since there's seven of them. Either way, it's awfully crowded down there. You might be able to slip like a little dot between those keys and those spare Pac-Mans. Pac-Men, I guess? But it wouldn't be very comfy. Now let's go back to that Twitter photo. <gasps> oh no! Billy! Somebody stole your Pac-Man! Let's see if we can track it down. Let's go back to that newscast. Here we are at 54 seconds into their segment. That's Billy playing, but that fifth spare Pac-Man is still AWOL. Here's a shot at 118. It's gone there too. Let's go back to that vanishing Facebook video and see if we can find it there. 
This video shows Billy playing the final few boards up to and including the split screen. And there you see that big gap between Pac-Man and the key, like a hockey goalie's grin. This is kind of a problem for Billy. Remember, you have to get to the split screen on your first life. Actually, I'll let Billy himself explain this one from that same Facebook video. Now on the side. Just in case you didn't understand the first time, Billy explained it again like a minute later. Well, that settles it then. Forget these gaps and missing points and science and stuff. Billy's not hiding from the truth. He's just looking straight at you and telling you what's what. Just like an honest man would. He wouldn't do all that and then just lie to everyone, would he? Let's skip to the very end. Here's a photo from a random attendee's Facebook page. You can see Billy's final displayed score of 292270. I know, it's a little fuzzy in that photo, but don't worry, we'll be seeing more of it soon. On the jumper version of Pac-Man, with all six lives, a perfect score should read 297360. With the millions digit missing, of course. So that's a difference of 5,090 points. We've already beaten that missing 5,000 points like it's a dead horse. The missing 90 points is due to Billy being down one life. Because remember, when you get to the split screen, there are 9 hidden dots that regenerate each time you die, so you cash in all of your lives for 90 points each. Now, it is certainly possible that, for some reason, Billy simply chose to play on settings that granted him 5 lives instead of 6. 4 lives would at least be factory default, but it can be set to 5 specifically instead of 6. It seems very uncharacteristic, and I remain highly skeptical that this would be the case. We also have photos and still shots from Billy playing his earlier attempts, in some cases showing 4 spare lives before the bonus life, or in one case a row of all 5 spare lives in addition to his current life for a total of 6. But we can't necessarily say those were the same game he later played to the split screen, nor could we prove that Billy didn't open up the cabinet door later and say, hey. I've been playing on 6 lives, but why don't I switch it down to 5 now for no discernible reason. I think he lost one of his lives at some point, probably when he failed to get a key, but I can't strictly rule out that he simply chose to play 5 lives instead of 6. However, none of that would excuse the missing 5,000 points. He botched something somewhere, and he came up short. No doubt about it. We have all of this documentation. It is not a thing that could possibly be argued otherwise. It is mathematics. You might speculatively say, well, maybe he simply played a different game later that day. Maybe he played this one all the way to the end for three or so hours, took some handshakes, then fired it right back up again for another five or so hours, and then he got the perfect score, and that would be the game everyone is referring to. Well, no, that doesn't work here either, and this is where our second question comes in. We've already beaten that first question into a pulp. So let's address the other one. Did Billy misrepresent a failed attempt as a successful one? You could try to hypothesize whether there was another complete game that day, which, by the way, there was not, or else there would have been some media associated with it, some photos or videos like the ones seen above, except where Billy is actually on perfect pace. But we don't even need to establish that there wasn't another game. All we need to demonstrate is that Billy misrepresented this game with the lower score as though it were a perfect score. Let's start with a clip from the newscast. We want to go all the way to the end, to the split screen, without missing any points, and so far we haven't. You can literally see as he's saying that he hasn't missed any points, that he's already down one life. That's already a thing, and it's not a voiceover where you could maybe argue that it was edited. No, that's just him in the clip saying it to the camera. 
Now here's where pedantic Billy Defenders, really grasping at those straws, might come in and say, well, actually, technically, he hasn't missed any points from losing a life, he doesn't lose out on those points until the split screen, so he hasn't missed any points yet. Which, given the way Billy is presenting his game in progress, would be quite a stretch. But, along the same lines, let's say for the sake of argument that Billy really did play on 5 lives instead of 6. Which would mean that at the time he made that declaration, he truly wasn't down a life from where he started. We also don't really get a good shot of the score during that part of the newscast, thanks to the on-screen graphic. So, while common sense says that Billy's perfect score bid is already sunk by the time he said that, we can't really prove it yet. So, let's move on. On the Facebook video, you can watch Billy playing the last eight boards of his game. Well, I mean, you could watch if they hadn't deleted it. The camera starts out a bit too far away to see the score, but as we discussed, you do see the missing Pac-Man at the bottom. Billy's just carrying on, discussing his game in progress, all the way into the split screen, where he begins cashing in his spare lives to collect those nine regenerating dots. When Billy is on his penultimate life, the host asks Billy for confirmation for what is about to happen. So two more Pac-Man, eight more The host said that Billy had to play two more Pac-Man, eat 18 more pellets, and that Billy would then have a, quote, perfect game. Billy then nodded in affirmation. A moment later, when Billy played his last life, he began counting down the final dots, starting with nine. Nine. So he's trapped over there yeah. now. So now just don't go near the guys and play the board. All right. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Did all the hard work, right? That's pretty cool. And that is a perfect game, or so it was declared. And look at that. The camera person was nice enough to swing right in and show us the final score ending in 2270. Remember, the perfect score should be ending in 7360 on 6 life settings, or at least 7270 on 5 life settings. I don't know about you, but that digit after the 9 does not look like a 7. That sure looks like a 2 to me. Lest you think I'm merely beating that same 5000 point horse again, it is necessary to show that the same game we saw all those clips and photos from, the same game in which Billy was down 5000 points all along, is the same game being celebrated here. Billy simply played that same game to completion, and passed it off as a perfect score, so he could declare victory. The effectiveness of this lie is demonstrated by all the people who, in the absence of a perfect score chart, simply accepted what they were being told. At 58 seconds into the newscast, the event host declares to everyone that Billy, quote, still has a perfect game going, end quote. A moment later, one observer refers to Billy making history, an apparent reference to the suggestion that Billy would be the first to do a perfect score on the jumper version. The segment also ends with the reporter declaring, a bit vaguely, that, quote, in the end, Mitchell did win, end quote. If that's too vague for you, let's go back to the end of Billy's game again. Just in case you had any doubt as to what you saw on the Multicon's own Facebook page, Joe Hills on YouTube was also in attendance and filmed the same scene from a distance. The same countdown, the same score ending in 2270, and the same declaration of, that is a perfect game. As if reality itself wanted to make sure we weren't confused, Joe titled his video, quote, I just saw a perfect game of Pac-Man completed at Music City Multicon, end quote. So yes, actual people in actual attendance very much believe they had just witnessed a perfect score of Pac-Man, 
And honestly, why shouldn't they believe it? After all, Billy made the crazy screen appear. I'm sure it looked like a perfect score. I'm not trying to pick on any of these individuals specifically, as none of this is their fault. When you go to a gaming presentation like this, you're expecting it to not just be a bunch of lies. Imagine if you tuned into like Games Done Quick or something, and you enjoyed watching nail-biting speedruns, and then found out that the entire show was fake. Like, what good does that serve? How does that help anyone? This might have helped Billy himself on his little publicity tour, but since this isn't the 1980s anymore, and since people actually have the ability to record things and preserve evidence, doesn't seem this helped him either. Now, some people might say to all this, oh, so what? It was still a great score, and it was still close enough to perfect. I bet you can't do a perfect score on Pac-Man. And, well, first of all, don't bet too much on that. But more to the point, if the score Billy got really was good enough, then why lie about it at all? If the distinction really isn't important, then that just makes all of this sadder. The entire thing was a farce that cheapened high score gaming for literally everyone. Billy stayed fully committed to the bit though. Two of the people seen in the newscast are hosts of the Broken Token podcast who also bore witness to Billy's alleged milestone feat. Here's one of the hosts in his own words in a December episode. So where this comes into play is Billy played the f- the um in public and, and so what 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 did he play? It, it, and I don't want to oversell it, but I want to sell it properly. Okay. That's so fair. I'm just going to be safe here because it's been a little bit. I'm a little removed from it. Mm-hmm. So he publicly played the first perfect Pac-Man on the advanced chipset. A month after the event, the hosts were still under the impression they had witnessed a perfect score and were thus still telling listeners that they saw Billy achieve such a score. And because apparently the situation wasn't already preposterous enough, the hosts then described what Billy did to mark the occasion. So that brings me yeah. to what's on the floor down here to my right. Oh, okay. What have you got? I'm trying to reach for it without ripping all the stuff off the table. Okay, be very careful. So Brent has uh, he's removed the headphones, and he's back up. Oh, he's got some I got a moving type. blanket. Yeah, you got a moving blanket. So wrapped up in this blanket, Whitney. I mean, is it, is what? It's soft, so I can't do any of Whitney at Whitney's Foley work. Okay. Work. So I'm, I'm, I'm just have envisioned me unwrap. Well, you can see it, but as listeners, just en- oh, this is cool. Envision, yeah. In- yeah. So it is a Pac-Man marquee. So the host continued telling the origin of these Pac-Man game marquees, which he brought to the event without apparently knowing that Billy would be attempting a perfect score. The host then continued. So he signed all three of them. Okay, cool. And in in on them, he wrote history's first Pac-Man. Um, original advanced chip and he dated it and signed it uh, Billy Mitchell and it's October 31st 2021 Billy Mitchell so what was really cool is I have three uh-huh. so he numbered them one of three two of oh, three and did. three of three how about that yes Billy Mitchell literally signed game marquees to commemorate the perfect score he didn't get Now, at the time of my recording, I have not yet found a photo of one of these marquees to confirm exactly what was written. The inscription, as read by the host, history's first Pac-Man original advanced chip, is a little odd. The host's probably inaccurate reading of it did not include the words perfect score or perfect game. But the implication is obvious, is it not? What else would have been first that day? I hope Billy doesn't think he was literally the first person to ever play the jumper revision. At any rate... The hosts themselves made it clear what the signed marquees were intended to commemorate. <laughs> so there's only three of those marquees now that yeah. commemorate this event of yeah. him playing the per- the first perfect Pac-Man on that variation of, of the Pac chip set. And uh, uh, now you've got one of them. You've got two. You've got two or three. So. So, yes, much to the disbelief of witnesses and much to the chagrin of lying trolls on the Internet. Billy Mitchell really did lie about a perfect score of Pac-Man to a whole crowd of trusting spectators who took him and his hosts at their word. I know, of all people. It just goes to show you that if someone lies to you hundreds and hundreds of times, you can just never be sure that they won't lie to you again. As to the matter of what exactly did happen at Music City Multicon and how this whole ruse was executed, there's one last question to be addressed, which I think is rather illuminating. If Billy had indeed lost a life... Playing Pac-Man in front of everyone like that, wouldn't everyone have noticed? Wouldn't they have heard that Pac-Man death sound? 
and gone, Oh no, what happened? Now, I do wish to be clear that, in general, Billy has shown himself to be an accomplished bullshit artist, so I don't really put that sort of subterfuge beyond him. Oh, I was supposed to die there. Don't worry, I can still get the perfect score. Don't believe your lying eyes. That sort of thing. But for the purposes of discussing the Music City Con, let's stipulate that someone would have noticed Billy losing a life. There's a common theme among these publicity campaigns of Billy's, which is misdirection. When trying to redo his Donkey Kong scores, he wanted everyone to focus on whether he could hit the final score of the contested tapes, and not pay attention to things like score pace or play style, which, as a competent Donkey Kong player, he knows the relevance of. Oh, and even using this misdirection, Billy had to lie about those final scores anyway, because he couldn't actually do what he was proclaiming to be capable of. Cutting away between all his beyond perfect attempts might have also worked out better for him had he gotten the score on the first day and not his tenth day. Many of Billy's antics resemble the act of a stage magician. Everybody look over here, and while you're looking here, pay no attention to what my assistant is doing over there. Since magic isn't real, the performer always has a curtain or a trap door or a colleague they can randomly select from the audience or something to make the illusion happen. For the Music City Con, Billy used his favorite magic curtain, which is the passage of time. What wasn't readily apparent in the initial reports was that Billy's phony perfect score was actually carried over from the night before. Here's a photo courtesy of Jacob Spencer Scott on Twitter showing Billy playing the cherry board, the first board of the game. This photo was publicly posted on Saturday night. Here are a couple other examples of Billy playing the early boards on Saturday night, which future me accumulated after doing this audio recording. Of course, you couldn't necessarily say that any of these were the same almost perfect score Billy played the next morning, but thankfully we have the broken token guys to help fill in the blanks yet again. In all fairness, uh, all honesty, I lost track <laughs> of the point count. Yeah, I, I, did, I did too. Because, because of the excitement of him doing this. Yeah, and, and we, I, I recall this as being a conversation we had near the beginning of his run. But of course, he parked the game overnight and oh, yeah. let it run. And then uh, and he then started playing back Saturday. Him, yep, yep, he did. And then when I left at noon on Sunday, he was still going. And so uh, it, it's not about how fast he did it. It's not about how, you know, or in how many hours that he did it or anything like that. He was aiming for getting the highest possible score on that ROM set is what he was going right. for. You also have the event host, as heard in the newscast at about 56 seconds, saying that Billy was about to resume his perfect score in progress from the night before. Started playing for several hours. Still got a perfect game going. He's going to pick it up again this morning. Come come check it out. So there you have it. Billy started his game Saturday night, then parked it overnight to continue it the next day. See? Remember how I told you way back at the beginning of this video how you can park Pac-Man in hiding spots and leave your game running indefinitely? That's called good writing, my friends. In that broken token clip, we also got a bit of emphasis on how Billy wasn't going for any sort of time attack, and thus leaving his game running for hours wasn't an issue, along with an admission that the only witnesses from Saturday night sort of lost track of the point count. And, as you saw in those earlier photos, it wasn't exactly a big crowd around Billy Saturday night, probably because Billy didn't want to draw everyone's attention to him failing at the blue time boards over and over. Someone could have stood next to Billy, watched him die, Heard him say, well, I'll just play this one a little longer for practice. Watched him park his game, then returned with him the next day, and be taken in by Billy's assertive confidence. No, no, this is a new game. That was an earlier game I died on. This one's still perfect. Or without even being prompted, they might have assumed, well, if Billy's saying this one is still perfect, he must have come in really early today and started again, and I just didn't see it. Just like how Billy's stack of secret papers says whatever he wants it to say, the passage of time obscures whatever Billy says it obscures. And before you say, oh, no one would fall for that, not if they were standing right there, we've just gone over a pile of evidence showing that Billy whiffed on a perfect score and told a crowd of people he didn't, and the crowd believed him. As someone who has researched the Billy case for four years now, it is amazing the mental links people will go to to avoid confronting the obvious conclusion that Billy simply lied to them and that he did it effectively. Even actual gaming enthusiasts in attendance at Music City Multicon who are making an effort to understand the situation, even they got the wool pulled over their eyes on this one. It happens. Live and learn. 
There is a bit of extra material here where David Race reached out to the Broken Token hosts after their initial podcast and tried to explain the situation to them. Rather than simply acknowledging, okay, I guess Billy lied to us, that's disappointing, the hosts had a follow-up segment in a subsequent episode where they basically said David was taking it too seriously and that Billy was nice to them, and in the end, that's all that really matters. Gee, I wonder why Billy is nice to podcast hosts while he goes around suing people who correctly point out what a massive liar he is. Also, some of David's replies to the newscast were getting deleted. You can find the details on all of that in the video notes if you wish. So, now that we've seen Billy succeed in lying to a crowd of spectators about what they just witnessed, what do we do with this information? I'll tell you exactly what you do. You take all of Billy's witness statements for his old scores, and you throw them in the garbage. How are we supposed to believe the word of his mortgage broker friends, or the staff of Funspot, or the staff of Boomer's Arcade, when even if we assume they aren't trying to lie, or that they have some idea of what they're looking at, we can show that Billy will lie to people's faces, and people will believe and report to others that they just witnessed a milestone gaming achievement when they did not. Thank you, Billy, for completely destroying what was left of your defense. This is why, when putting the word of witnesses up against permanent objective evidence, the evidence always wins. Oh, and I can't forget to mention this bodes very poorly for Billy's claim that he got a perfect score of Pac-Man in July of 1999, where the final portion of the tape has never been published despite Billy retaining possession of it, and where the only photo seen from that day is of Billy standing next to a Pac-Man cabinet that appears to be back in attract mode. You can read all about that in the conclusion of our series, The Video Game Fraud of the Century, at PerfectPacman.com. I will say, though, the story of the Music City Con does have a happy ending, since Billy made a big deal about doing the first perfect score on this specific variation of Pac-Man, and since he failed to achieve it, David Race, the true Pac-Man champion, swooped in and got the actual Jumper version perfect score himself, completing his game with all 3,297,180 points shortly after midnight on November 10th. Granted, this was on factory settings, granting only four lives instead of six, but it's still a perfect score, and it's still more points than Billy got. I guess if we were to believe Billy, that would make this score beyond perfect. And that, my friends, is the story of the Music City Con. I'd love to give a big thank you to David Race for accumulating much of this evidence in the first place, to Andrew Barrow for answering a question I had about the Aussie Kong off, a massive thank you to Jace Hall for fighting the good fight against evil, a thank you to Carl Jobst for his outstanding videos on Billy, and a shout out to the Whistle Crew for that delightful fish recipe. Thank you. Please be well, everyone. Be excellent to each other. And the next time you consider having Billy Mitchell on your show or at your event so that he can tell everyone about the time he traveled to Narnia and met the Tooth Fairy, Optimus Prime, and Nelson Mandela, please consider that he might not be telling you the truth and that maybe, just maybe, you might look pretty foolish for believing him. Don't be mad. I'm just trying to help. Thank you for watching. Good night. And he wrote his words to the tunes of the day To be passed along the Union by And the strikes were led and the songs were spread And Joe Hill was always on the line Yes, Joe Hill was always on the line